So this video is going to be about tonicizing diatonic harmonies and diatonic harmonies that aren't necessarily the dominant. <laughs> Reviewing real quick what tonicization is, we're talking about a dominant structure chord of some sort, uh, 5, 7, or 7, 7, 7, 6, any of those varieties, um, inversions or root position, and we're applying them to a diatonic chord. And by applying them, we're taking the diatonic chord, we're treating it as a temporary tonic, which means we're borrowing its leading tone and using that leading tone to point to its root as some sort of reference and that's how we're using this sort of idea of tonicization and then what can be tonicized again we're talking about just stable chords major or minor chords unstable chords diminished and augmented uh, cannot be tonicized uh, using uh, any sort of applied dominant function anyways so let's see just a few examples of how tonicization can play out in different contexts so here's the first example starts its life off very clearly affirming B minor. And this could have cadenced after this sort of ending point to get to B minor a little bit more convincingly. Real easy to make it kind of happen again. You just have to run to a predominant afterward. Uh, otherwise, you might get stuck in the median, as it were here. If we look at the Roman numerals and contextual analysis, we can see that tonic is expanded. And at the end, we come to rest on this really pronounced D major chord. And why is it really pronounced? Well, it's pronounced because of this 5-7 that's borrowed from D major, this A, C sharp, E, and G natural context. And you might notice that when you're tonicizing the median in minor mode, there's a lot of uh, pitches that are unchanged between the two events. There's not a lot of chromaticism, in other words. And that's to be expected. We're tonicizing essentially the relative major. All we need is to not have the minor mode's leading tone evoked. So by making T into Te, where basically Te is the same as Sol in the relative major. So that's why we're not seeing a whole lot of accidentals here. But overall, just tonic expansion, because we know that a three chord is strikingly similar to a tonic chord in the end. Now let's take that Do, Re, Me expansion of tonic and let's keep expanding it. So noticing at the end, let's think about what kind of chord that is at the very end here. Looks like we have G, E, B, and E. Looks like an E minor chord which if we're in B minor, we can make sense of as a pretty normative four chord, a four six chord even, because it's got the third in the bass. So then backing up, there is one chord that doesn't fit into B minor. It looks like a B major chord with an A natural in the bass. So if we look at that chord, that penultimate chord, we can see, I see a second between A natural and B, a verticality of a second. That tells me that B might be the root of that chord and it might be a 4-2 position that gets created because above that A natural, I see a D sharp. I see an augmented fourth above it. And where do we see augmented fourths? In 5-4-2 shapes. So if we're looking at this, we can make sense of that chord in the context of E minor. It doesn't make much sense in B minor, especially with that chordal seventh added and in the bass, no doubt. But in the context of E minor, it makes a lot of sense as a secondary function. And it's doing exactly as we would expect it to do. Chordal seventh in the bass is stepping down to first inversion, while the temporary leading tone steps up to the chordal root. So this is what a tonicization of four might look like. One way it might look, anyways. So now let's look at a few different tonicizations happening in one chord progression. Looks like we're in D flat major overall with this one. 
And if we look at something like the first chord of each measure, we can make sense of a tonic chord. Then measure two, we have G flat in the bass, D flat, G flat, and B flat. It looks like a four chord. And then the downbeat of the last measure, A flat, E flat, A flat, C natural. It looks like a five chord. So this looks like it goes one, four, five in terms of downbeat to downbeat to downbeat. But it's decorated. So let's look at this first accidental that we see. C flat. Lowered seven, te, is a real good sign that points toward a four chord in a lot of contexts like this one. So let's see exactly what's going on with this. Well, if we spell the chord F, D flat, A flat, C flat, it looks like some sort of dominant shaped chord. And if we look at from F to C flat, just the outer voices here, that's a diminished fifth in the outer voices. That tells me it's either 565 or 77 as a first guess anyways, because that's a common intervallic structure to see there. And in this case, it looks like some sort of D flat dominant seventh chord. All right, so like a major minor seventh chord. Now, where do we see a D flat dominant seventh chord? Well, in the context of G flat major, which is exactly where this one ends up going. If we look further into this example, I see another chord with a bunch of accidentals. G natural, F flat, B flat, D flat. If we spell that in thirds, we might find that it's G, B flat, D flat, F natural. Or we could speed that up even. If we look at G natural up to F flat, that's the interval of a diminished seventh. Well, we only know of one chord that has a diminished seventh in it, and it's a fully diminished seventh chord. So maybe we can make sense of that chord as a diminished seventh of where it goes. Now, can we make sense of a G fully diminished seventh chord in the context of the following A flat major chord? And we absolutely can. Recall that full or half diminished both occur pretty equally in major mode. In minor mode, only fully diminished is what tends to happen. So then if we look at this in terms of analysis, it looks like we have a five, six, five of four going to four, and then a seven, fully diminished seven of five going to five. So we have our tonic that's expanded a little bit with this secondary function of four, and which makes sense. It's basically a tonic chord. It's basically a tonic chord, but with an added note. So that's all expanding tonic. And then we get our strong predominant, and then the expansion of that predominant through the seven, seven of five to five motion. And I could have put a cadential label on here, but it looks like I forgot that one, so my bad there. Uh, but it's a ton of sized half cadence that gets created at the end of this excerpt, for sure. All right, so there's a few different things happening in this example, which I'll play it for you, and then I'll just talk through it. So we're in the key of E flat major because the end is a deceptive resolution. And we know it's a deceptive resolution because before we have that cadential 6-4 chord and a strong predominant getting into it. Really all we need is that 6-4 chord tells us what key we're in at that point, being a cadential 6-4 chord. So then if we look at the very beginning, we see this tonic that's expanded and it's basically the progression is a tonic chord to a 6 chord. But we have passing motion. So then we look at that second chord with the chromaticism and we say, well, what is this chord? And if we spell it off of G natural, G, B, D, and F, well, that looks like a dominant seventh in the key of C, either major or minor. And we know that in E flat major, we're talking about C minor more than likely. So that's how we can get five, four, three that's borrowed from C minor and plugged into this E flat major context. And then measure two, looking at that chord, well, A, up to G flat, as we saw in a previous example, that diminished seventh tells us all we need to know about what is happening there. It's an A diminished chord. And that A diminished chord belongs to the context of the dominant. It belongs to a B flat major or minor scenario. In this case, B flat major, because we're in E flat major globally. Now look at that seventh, look at that tenor line anyways. That tenor line 
is probably something that's going to be buried in an inner voice here. It's a chordal seventh, and before we might say, like, yeah, put a chordal seventh in the melody because it'll write itself. But notice that that chordal seventh's journey through Cadential 6-4, it's a little, let's say, serpentine. So it's probably not going to make the most appealing melody anyways to have that in the uppermost voice. So composers would tend to bury that into an inner voice so that they can make or take advantage of some more normative uh, melodic motion in general. So now taste is going to start dictating some of our decision makings um, in terms of what do we put in the melody. But when you see a melody or see a line that's kind of chromatically moving and it's kind of like stuck, notice that this is stuck around E flat and G and it kind of fills in that gap. That's the type of stuff you probably don't want to put into a melody. Uh, if it has a clear direction like Mi, Fa, Fi, Sol, that's very bass line type of stuff. So we'll talk about these things more and more. And you might notice like we tonicize six in measure two. The end is a six chord. Could that be tonicized? For instance, something that sounds like. So the answer is obviously yes, because I did that. And I'm gonna talk about extended cadential techniques in a later video. So hang on to that one for just a little bit and we'll come back to that. All right, so tonicizations in general, again, we're applying a dominant from a key and we're borrowing it and its leading tone into a new key area. And we're resolving those tendency tones into these major or minor stable harmonies because we're borrowing their dominant chord. And the applied chord functions are gonna happen within larger hierarchical functions. In other words, they're gonna happen within tonic expansion or within predominant expansion, as in the secondary functions of five. And we can also see them within like dominant function two, which is gonna be done in a later video where I talk more about cadential techniques. Uh, but this is essentially what we're talking about with tonicization. It's gonna to still happen within one of these three functions. Uh, it's not gonna be removed from them anyways. And what we're looking for to find them, accidentals. They're gonna drive and signify what's being tonicized. They're gonna to point to it. In specific, uh, those raised accidentals. Because if we see something that's pushed up and then resolving in the direction of that inflection, it might be doing some sort of temporary T-do type of thing anyways.